Officer, uh, rules of this Parliament prevent me from asking crucial questions about the scandal over the SNP finances. So I cannot dwell on this here, but I do want to give the First Minister an opportunity to be transparent with my opening question today. Because last night the First Minister became the SNP's Treasurer. So while this is still a party matter, it is also now a government matter if the First Minister is compromised. Mm -hmm. If his hands are tied, if the party of government is about to go bankrupt, or if he himself may become involved in the police investigation. And yesterday, the Deputy First Minister said this. Going forward, the governance of the party needs to be about transparency, openness, and people should be able to question about the accounts. And we agree and believe that there are legitimate questions that the Scottish public deserves to know answers to. So in the interests of transparency, will Hamza Youssef agree to make a statement to Parliament on the financial scandal engulfing the party of government here in Scotland? Um, what I would say to, to Mr Ross is that obviously in terms of standing orders, First Minister's questions is the opportunity to put questions to the First Minister that fall within the responsibilities of the First Minister as First Minister and of course the responsibilities of his government and therefore I am not entirely clear that that question has met the requirements of standing orders. Um, I, I am looking at the First Minister to see if he has anything he wishes to add to what I have said. First Minister. I, I am happy uh, to answer the question. I, I know there are uh, some of course serious issues for the party that I lead the SNP to address. I am not going to shy away from that uh, presiding uh, officer. That is why in my very first act as SNP leader attending my very first National Executive Committee, I am pleased that we got agreement from that committee. They elected uh, the body uh, that oversees the party uh, that is elected by our members to our review into transparency and governance. And not only into transparency and governance review, but one that has external input, particularly in the issues of financial oversight. So, of course, that is an important job, an important role for me to take forward as leader of the SNP. But let me also say that what I am doing and what the government I lead, what we are doing collectively, is focusing relentlessly on the day job. That is why, in the first few weeks of being First Minister, I, not I didn't just double the fuel insecurity fund, I made sure we tripled yeah. the fuel insecurity fund. Now, I know Douglas Ross won't want to talk about that because, of course, it lays bare the harm the Tory cost of living crisis yeah. is doing to households up and down the country. But that's also why, in the first few weeks as First Minister, I made sure I focused... I will suspend proceedings, First Minister. Please resume your seat. Resume proceedings. Please continue, First Minister. Douglas Ross will be pleased. It was me that got interrupted uh, for, for once, uh, no doubt. Uh, this is why, in the first few weeks as First Minister, I also announced £15 million for school aged childcare, targeted towards the lowest income households. £25 million, additional £25 million to support the just transition, additional funding to support GP practices that are in our areas of highest deprivation. £25 million to be able to buy back or long lease empty properties yeah. for the social rented sector. Yeah. So these are priorities uh, for me, the priorities of the Scottish people. And while I take my responsibility as leader of the SNP extremely seriously, I and the government that I lead uh, will be focused relentlessly on the priorities of the Scottish people. Yeah. 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 Ross. The, the first words from the First Minister when he stood up uh, where he was happy to answer the question and then basically refused to do so because I was simply asking uh, for a statement and transparency uh, and I do think it is needed from the First Minister because the secrecy uh, must end. But I'm going to move on to one of the matters of substance that the First Minister should be focusing his attention on instead of his huge distra distraction within the party. Uh, last year, an SNP government agency introduced guidelines that encouraged more lenient sentences on under 25s, even in some of the worst crimes. The Justice Secretary was just asked about this in the session before FMQs. So can I ask the First Minister, does he fully support the policy which was brought forward for consultation when he was Justice Secretary? 
First Minister. Can I say that this is, of course, a very important issue uh, indeed. And while uh, I won't comment on individual sentencing decisions, it wouldn't be right for me to do so uh, as First Minister. Let me just clarify uh, uh, some issues around the sentencing guidelines, which I think are really, really important. I heard Angela Constance uh, make these uh, points uh, in response to a question earlier on. Uh, sentencing guidelines are, of course, rightly, entirely the responsibility of the Independent Sentencing Council. Decisions about whether to approve those guidelines are, of course, for the High Court. Now, uh, the, the, Cabinet Secretary, the new Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice and Home Affairs, uh, she has written to the Chair of the Sentencing Council to discuss their important work. And that letter knows that she will discuss how the Council plans to keep uh, those published guidelines uh, under review. But it is also important that when it comes to decisions on sentencing, not only are they rightly for the independent judiciary, but also that they are evidence-based. And for anybody who has read that sentencing guideline, I'm assuming uh, Douglas Ross has done so, you can see a comprehensive guideline that is evidence-based in terms of its sentencing of young people. And the last thing I would say, presiding officer, on that sentencing guideline, of course, uh, notwithstanding all of the good uh, that is uh, in there, it's very, very clear that there is no bar on imposing a custodial sentence on a young person where, of course, the judiciary consider that to be appropriate. But that must be a decision not for the First Minister, not for government ministers, neither, I would say, for opposition colleagues. It is a decision, rightly, for the independent judiciary. Dr Shaws. A few weeks ago, my party and almost everyone in Scotland was outraged at the case of a 13-year-old girl who was raped at a park in Dalkeith. Her attacker, Sean Hogg, was found guilty of rape, but he didn't go to prison. All he had to do was carry out 270 hours of unpaid work. The judge said if Hogg had committed the crime when he was over 25, he would now be behind bars. So that confirms that the problem here is the sentencing guidelines that were introduced. It's very clear that the SNP's justice system is broken. So will the First Minister fix it? Uh, before I ask the First Minister to respond, I would remind everybody in the Chamber that this actually is a live case and therefore any reference there too should be made with extreme caution. First Minister. Uh, and with that uh, caveat uh, in place, presiding officer, uh, let me also say uh, in my reaction uh, to that case, I can understand why people do have concern, but I must go back to the central point here that sentencing decisions are, of course, rightly for the independent courts and the independent judiciary. The Lord President reminded me of that uh, when he made some remarks uh, on the public record when I attended the court of session uh, to give my oath as the First Minister of Scotland. And I committed to upholding the independence uh, of the judiciary, a, a responsibility I take with the utmost seriousness. I also read the very distressing account of the, 13, uh, the victim who was 13-year-old uh, at the time and also heard from her family uh, on the public statements that have been made. And anybody, I think everybody, frankly, uh, would sympathise with the strong feelings uh, of uh, the victim. And it's important to say at this stage, talking in the general, not about that specific case, of course, that 98% of all of those who are convicted of rape, uh, were, were convicted of rape between 2018 and 2021, did receive a custodial sentence. So it is important that we continue to give the judiciary the independence that they have. It's important to have that separation uh, between government and judiciary. Uh, but what I would say is that in the letter that Angela Constance has sent to the Sentencing Council, to uh, the Lord Justice uh, Clark, uh, they want, uh, she would like to discuss and the government would like to discuss the issues around how these sentencing guidelines are kept under review. And I take the point that Douglas Ross makes. There is clearly a public interest uh, in that sentencing guideline. Douglas Ross. The First Minister mentioned that he had seen the comments from the victim and her family, and this is all in the public domain and is very legitimate to raise here in the Chamber. The grandfather of the victim said this, with this new ruling they've got, any person under 25 can go out and do any crime they want, however horrendous it may be, and there's a good chance that they will get a community payback. And the survivor of this rape said this, when I was told he had been found guilty, I felt a wave of emotions. I didn't know how to react. I cried. I think I cried with relief. Now it makes me think, why did I even bother reporting the rape in the first place? 
She continued, whoever is in charge of the justice system needs to sort this out. You say you care about victims like me, but how can a serial rapist receive 270 hours of community payback? Her final line was, why is it okay to rape anyone and not go to jail? The First Minister seems to be hailing 98% of people convicted of rape going to prison. It should, it must be 100% of rapists convicted of that crime going to prison. So let me repeat the words of the victim as my question to the First Minister. Why is it okay for anyone to rape someone and not go to jail? First Minister. So again, speaking uh, in the general, not a bit of spe spe specific case, uh, I, I agree with the sentiment that if somebody commits rape, they should go to jail. I believe that. But of course, I also believe very, very firmly that it is up, it is up to the independent judiciary, it is up to yeah. judges, uh, it is up to uh, those in the High Court to make a decision about what the appropriate punishment is for an individual for the crime that they have committed. And let me again uh, just refer back to the sentencing guideline, which is, of course, the central issue that Douglas Ross uh, raises with me. The guidelines make it clear that as well as looking at issues around rehabilitation, consideration of sentencing for young people under 25, they make it very, very clear in that sentencing guideline that other factors, including punishment, protection of the public, uh, and expressing uh, strong disapproval of offending behaviour, should also be taken into account. So the courts can still, even with this guideline in place, impose a custodial sentence on a young person if they consider that to be appropriate in light of all the facts. But I take uh, what, what has been said by the victim and indeed uh, her grandfather uh, very, very seriously uh, indeed. And that's why we are looking <coughs> to improve uh, the, the justice system when it comes to particularly those uh, individuals, particularly women who are uh, often the victims of sexual offences uh, and, of course, uh, rape. And we'll shortly introduce our criminal justice reform bill, which seeks to make those changes uh, to the court system, to the justice system, in order to be able to uh, improve uh, the experience and improve outcomes of justice for victims of sexual offences and rape. And I hope it will get support from right across the chamber. I call it question number two, Anna Sabar. Officer, on Tuesday, Hamza Yusuf.